So this is a, a an overview of the changes uh, to the EKF. Um, 2019 through to where we are in 2020. A um, uh, couple of looking more closely at a couple of the major, um, you know, functional improvements and and some of the more significant bug fixes. And then we'll finish off with a discussion, uh, looking at uh, what, how do we take some of those existing or partially completed features forward, and what are the uh, areas to sort of focus on for the next 12 months. So. If we have a look uh, where we are at the moment, uh, most of the work, um, which is which is good, has gone into sort of minor enhancements, not major features, but uh, enhancements and and minor enhancements and bug fixes. And I think I'm going. I've, Fridge, you've already talked about the world magnetic model uh, changes to the EKF. You covered that yesterday, didn't you? Uh, not really, no. Okay. Um, so uh, I was going to mention it very briefly in, in my systems talk later today, but only for a few seconds. Okay, so I'll, I'll just cover this very quickly then. So what we've done, or what Tridge has done, he's, he's added um, the, the ability to use the world magnetic model, you know, the, the magnetic field at the, at the GPS location where the vehicle's flying, and we use that to put bounds on essentially an upper lower limit on the field values that the EKF learns as it flies. And what this effectively does is that if you have very bad magnetic interference on your vehicle, large electromagnetic interference, it stops the EKF learning an incorrect value for the Earth's magnetic field and just buys you a bit more time, makes it a bit more robust to those sort of large compass errors. So that's, for people flying with large levels of magnetic interference that they really should have calibrated or fixed. But anyway, that's, that's something that's been worthwhile. And there is a parameter. I'm just gonna to pop to the PR for that. Uh, can you see that on your screens? Hopefully that's come through. Yep, it's there. Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so the, uh, this, this does add a, add a parameter. And the um, and the parameter, um, which is set, specifies the the amount of um, variation um, from the Earth magnetic field before the EKF starts to, to to limit the the learning. In other words, how much variation from the um, from the Earth's magnetic field value is the EKF allowed to uh, to depart from? And I think the value for the parameter, which is called the EK2 or EK3, depending on which EKF you're using. And you'll see there's a mag EF lim param, and that's currently set to 50 milligauss. We started out at 30, but realized it needed to be a bit larger. So uh, that's, the, um, that's something to look out for if you've upgraded uh, in, the, in the last 12 months and you're operating with a very noisy magnetometer. Uh, the other item that went in, was we uh, improved uh, for EKF2, we haven't done it for EKF3 yet, but we improved the use of the optical flow to estimate height above terrain for EKF2. And uh, if we have a quick look at uh, that pull request, um, what that's enabled is that uh, uh, by a change to the derivation, change to the mathematics, we're now able to, uh, with, with flight testing, we've shown that we can pretty accurately estimate the height of the terrain under the vehicle. And by the time the vehicle comes into the flare and its, its final landing, um, the height estimated by the uh, optical flow sensor um, is effectively uh, within about 30 centimetres, 20 centimetres of the terrain. So, it's proven to be useful for uh, autonomous landings with planes. Uh, and we've got some bug fixes, which we'll cover later, uh, some of the more significant ones. And we still got three open, we got three open feature requests, which I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, bit about at the end of the presentation. Um, there's uh, Randy submitted a PR to get some basic support for, ex for an external uh, nav system for EKF3, uh, partly due to 
my distractions at the time. I didn't get back to that. And then subsequent to that, Randy's done some testing with that and he found some situations with that particular nav system where if he yawed quickly, uh, it would produce some pretty bad outputs. So we, we'll, we'll discuss that later at the end of the presentation. Um, there's some work done looking at sensor affinity control. And, and just to explain what that is, there are some theoretical benefits to if you've got multiple GPSs, multiple compasses, multiple IMUs, to actually having, having different EKFs with different combinations of sensors. So EKF1 would use GPS1, EKF2 would use GPS3 and so on. And if we're running a board like an F7 or an H7, we could actually have a matrix of EKFs running combinations of sensors. And that would provide a, a high level of tolerance to uh, loss or, or corruption of a single sensor data because you could then start doing voting on the output or on the median select on the outputs from those EKFs. I don't think we can do that on, a, on an F4, but it's certainly something that we could look at for an F7 or an H7. And then uh, we also had a feature which, uh, in, which has been added in the last uh, few weeks, which enables us to fly a multi-rotor with, with either no compass or with a bad compass and automatically align the, align the yaw in flight. And we'll cover that a bit later. Okay. All right, these are the bug fixes I thought it's worth bringing to attention of the uh, users. The first one was one that if you currently fly with three compasses enabled and you haven't upgraded your software version uh, since this PR went in, then you might you want to pay attention to this. And it was a situation where if we had three healthy compasses and and it ended up in a situation where it was rejecting the compass measurements and it would flip flick through to compasses that it would always go back to the um, the first compass and not try the other compasses so it doesn't affect you if you have two compasses but if you have three compasses and they're all uh, and and selected or enabled and they're all healthy then this bug definitely would have affected you in some circumstances so another reason why it's, why these upgrades are worthwhile and uh, the next one, we had a lane switch bug fix. Um, I'll talk about that very quickly. It's, it, this was the issue if you had three or more EKF cores enabled. Now this doesn't affect, most people don't fly with three EKF cores enabled, some do. But unfortunately, this bug meant that if the current lane was unhealthy, it would always, it chooses the last healthy lane, but it didn't choose the lane with the lowest score. And there was another bug uh, which was found um, if we had uh, a high CPU load at the time. So that's been fixed. Thank you, uh, Tridge, for uh, finding and fixing that one. Uh, the next one we had, we had a situation where after doing the in-flight yaw reset, for example, after you climb up above five metres um, and it resets the yaw because it's away from sources of magnetic interference on the ground, um, it was noticed that the the mag biases uh, were slow to learn. And it turned out that the covariance matrix wasn't being um, reset correctly. And that's been fixed. Uh, we also then had something affecting those that were using the range use height uh, parameter. And I think Randy, you found that one. Uh, thank you for fixing that. And you could have a combination of the range use height parameter that would result in, um, in, in an altitude reset. Um, when the vehicle was descending and coming back into land again. Um, and that's, that's been fixed. That obviously only affects a small um, percentage of users, but it, when it is a bug that could occur uh, depending on people's parameter settings. So if you, if you do use range finder and you are using this uh, range uh, use height param, then um, just have a look at that uh, bug fix and see if it affects you. Okay, and then I think there was some, uh, we had rover wheel encoder fixes, um, uh, that's gone in. I think that was enabling um, a different, um, 
There was a bunch of fixes. I think Randy can probably comment on that if you want to break in on this. I know this, this is relevant for um, Rover users. Randy, yes. do you have any, any comments on this? Uh, yeah, I actually I forget this one. It was a while ago now. Um, yeah, yeah I, I remember, yeah, there was something about uh, we were only, this is the one where we were only using one of the, um, one of the uh, wheel encoder fixes, maybe not. Oh, yes, if the, if the wheel data was coming in at too high a rate, um, yeah. then it would effectively end up rejecting one of your wheel encoders and not use that data. Yeah, I think if that's the one, then yeah, I remember this one. Okay. That's yeah. good to get it. Okay. And then we had one which affected users with uh, dual GPSs, and they might have had them out on a large copter or a large fixed wing plane out on wingtips, where if it was switching between um, uh, GPS receivers, that there would be a position jump. And I think. Tridge found that up. He found particularly moving baseline GPS setups and that's gone in. I don't know how many people have, uh, are using those types of setups, but that's been in since, well, early this year. So it hasn't been in very long. Um, and Tridge, have you had any uh, feedback from users since that uh, uh, patch went in? Um, it definitely does does fix an issue. The, the reason it matters is people were getting, we actually deliberately switched GPS when we're using moving baseline. Um, we switched to the GPS that's providing the yaw and when it can't provide yaw anymore, we switched back to the other one. And that caused the vehicle to jump suddenly sideways by half of the distance between the two GPSs. Quite disconcerting when in loiter. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, but it was a very sharp movement because um, it didn't do any of the smoothing and things. So it's just sort of that's went. That's right. That's back. where you see what Leonard's uh, loops look like when, when, when there is an input shaping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's a very distinctive uh, effect. But there's, there's very few people actually running with that moving baseline GPS at the moment. So yeah. I, uh, there's only two groups I know of that, that were affected by this. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that. Okay, so I'm going to answer. I put this up about every second year because the question comes up on a regular basis. I won't read through it. If you want to know, we've got, we have, uh, for those new to the project, you'll see EKF2 and you'll see EKF3. And there was an EKF1, but that's been deprecated. So uh, they have a subset of features. Um, pretty much for the more advanced features, most people are using EKF3 except for um, the external nav system attitude and position data that currently not supported in EKF3 and we need to get that fixed um, uh, this year because it's got some other stuff which is good um, you know position um, estimation with range to static beacons for UWB radios visual odometry wheel encoders external heading sensors like dual antenna GPS and it also works for a wider range of vehicles because it does three axis accelerometer bias. It's not quite as robust if you're shaking it and moving it around on startup, but we actually, you know, I mean, I'm talking about quite vigorous motion, but, you know, we've got uh, basic checks in, in place to make sure that, that, uh, that that's not a, not a, a problem in practice uh, on alignment. And, uh, we eventually will move across to EKF3, uh, but it's been a longer process because EKF2 has just been doing a, a pretty good job on, particularly on fixed wing, uh, they like it. <laughs> okay. Now this has been a, an initiative which started, and this is probably a major focus of my, uh, my talk uh, today is a pain point for many of us uh, from probably day one in this project has been the magnetometer. Uh, they're, they're difficult to place, particularly in larger airframes with uh, higher uh, current flows. Okay, we do have um, current compensation. Um, if you're trying to operate near large inspection on large industrial sites. Um, uh, for example, I worked with somebody who was doing inspection on snake stacks. 
they were steel and getting close to them, the, the magnetic uh, deviation was so large and same thing with power line inspections that it, they just weren't able to operate unless they switched into out hold mode because uh, the, the position started to skate around. So, and also you had the flyaway issue with taking off with the yaw being, um, you know, rotated. Now we've made, that doesn't happen very often because we nearly, most users are flying with more than one magnetometer and we do a consistency check on the ground. But if the magnetic field on the ground um, is misaligned with respect to the world magnetic model declination tables, then that doesn't help. So th there are a few initiatives. Um, we've added the ability to use your from a dual antenna uh, GPS. I mean, that, is, that does work well. It, does, it is more expensive hardware. And you do need a higher signal to noise ratio on the GPS to, to operate in that RTK mode. Um, the other option is to actually, and we can do this currently, is that if you have aligned your yaw and then you fly, it's possible to use the motion of the vehicle combined with the GPS data to maintain, the, uh, 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 maintain uh, your uh, accuracy. Um, but you can't currently just take off, uh, have a, a, a heading uh, that's you know, 180 degrees away from the true value, just start flying around and then hope that the UKF will sort it out. So what we've done is we've, I haven't looked at the, the data and obviously we have, it's, it's responsible for the majority of loss of navigation events once you've solved vibration issues. And I talked last year about vibration. Uh, what we needed was a method of being able to align the yaw uh, reliably and also provide a backup yaw estimate that didn't rely on the magnetometer, it didn't rely on an external uh, yaw sensor. So, the we've added some uh, changes to make it a bit more robust to the magnetometer. Uh, that's been good, uh, but it still requires you to have a magnetometer. Okay, so I think this was presented back in 2018. Um, I presented some uh, mat preliminary uh, MATLAB modeling work and that was looking at feasibility of could we actually use just the IMU and just the GPS velocity data and uh, get a reliable estimate of your starting off with no knowledge of your angle and then work the your angle out uh, as the vehicle started to move. So myself and, uh, and, and a colleague of mine, uh, Ridava Khan, we worked through um, uh, with MATLAB uh, scripting uh, with a bunch of different uh, filter uh, methods. And you could look at all the combinations there that we tried. It's quite extensive, everything from very simple up to you know, more complex and highly computationally expensive, which is the particle filter. And then based on that preliminary uh, simulation work, we um, selected the Gaussian sum filter um, combination with an extended Kalman filter that would provide a, a good performance computational cost trade-off for our application. Um, now, I'll just explain what that alphabet soup means. <laughs> Gaussian, so GSF stands for Gaussian sum filter, EKF stands for extended Kalman filter. So what does this algorithm look like? Well, we have five. Um, we basically start out with five separate AHRS solutions using complementary filters. They get, they calculate a predicted your angle and a forward right acceleration. Uh, and they take in the IMU data. We can also use airspeed, either measured or just an average estimate for that flight vehicle, the centripetal acceleration correction during fixed wing flight. And it's important that these AHRS solutions do not use GPS data, that they are independent. And interestingly, these will provide an independent attitude estimate back up for, for planes um, to be able to fly and provide an attitude estimate if you didn't have GPS. And that may be of interest um, to uh, the, uh, the plane flyers. We then have a bank of five three state extended camera filters. Now the state's northeast velocity and your angle. And they're very simple because there are only three states. And we start out with all three of them having the your angles, your estimates spaced 72 degrees um, uh, apart. 
and uh, 72, anyway, <laughs> it's, it's 360 <laughs> uh, divided by five. And so, and then we start out with the assumption that we don't know which one is correct. And we use the GPS Northeast velocity as an observation. And when we take the outputs from those filters and then we combine them using what's called a Gaussian sum filter, you can look like that up on Wikipedia if you want to know what it is. I'm not gonna put up equations and send you to sleep. And that provides a your angle estimate, which is the weighted average of the individual your estimates from those extended Kalman filters. Now, what does that look like um, in terms of a block diagram? Um, I'll give you a little bit of time to digest that. But you can see we start out with IMU data and airspeed data that goes into the attitude heading reference system calculations. They're very efficient. They're based on the old DCM um, we used to use back in the early 8-bit uh, processing days. Um, they output a yaw angle and a front right acceleration, you know, projected onto the horizontal. Uh, that goes into the um, EKFs, and each EKF has its individual yaw estimate, and then they go into the gas in some filter. It combines the estimates and comes out with a composite estimate. And, I've in, and what I've provided there, um, along with the block diagram is a description of where in the log, uh, log message, you can actually find these separate variables. Okay, so what's the progress? Well, this sat for two years because it's, it, it required a, block, a serious amount of time to do, to take it from a MATLAB concept working in three degrees of freedom to MATLAB working in six degrees of freedom into, into coding. And particularly the MATLAB modeling and the six degree freedom modeling work uh, was a time commitment that I just didn't have. Fortunately, the, the planets aligned and I had three companies that, um, that support me, which is uh, Wintra uh, and Altera, who work on the PX4 um, um, project and SIPAC, who I do, uh, do work with, who I work for. Uh, planets aligned. And this was a capability that was uh, that, that that they all had, but it wasn't a it wasn't a high priority. But with a little bit of time put together, we were able to take it to a six stop project pilot in MATLAB, and then separate coding for the ECL and the RG Pilot libraries, you know, due to licensing issues. Now that feature has now been merged into PX4 Master. It's going to be part of the upcoming release, and there's a pull request submitted to RG pilots. Um, we're working through with testing on that, trying to make it um, more generic as a, as a method. It's currently a separate class that's used by EKF2 and EKF3. But we, uh, Tritch had some ideas about we could maybe even pull it out here into a separate library. Uh, it's worth pointing that both the RG pilot and PX4 projects have benefited from that parallel development. Because when you're doing uh, development and testing, um, on, on, in multiple places, you learn, you're learning things at a faster rate and, and lessons have been, um, you know, uh, basically cross-pollinated as a result. Um, with these types of estimation um, development projects, uh, it's got to be methodical and testing is just so important. So the more testing support I can get on something like this, the better. And Randy was the first uh, RG pilot uh, developer to risk his own copter. <laughs> actually, sorry, okay. if I can jump in. I actually lost a copter um, post testing, though. It worked great. Uh, it was awesome. But uh, then I forgot to switch all the settings back. And then the next time I flew with the uh, current master code, I smashed it into a tree. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> okay, so you didn't set the frame. So, you had a deliberately rotated compass, your by. 180 degrees and you took off with the old code. Yeah, it's actually quite hard um, with all the pre-arm checks and stuff to make it uh, fly with the compass pointing in the wrong direction. But if you're careful, you can do it. And uh, yeah, I had set it up that way. <laughs> okay, so what have we done to date? Uh, we have a, we've done testing with multi-copters and, and a couple of scenarios. One is taking off with the declination set up to 180 degrees from truth. And that, that's pretty exciting when you take off in Lauter or Auto, having done that. And uh, the previous behavior, you would have it rapidly accelerate away, then the EK failsafe would uh, kick in, and then it would descend 
in a non-position control mode, drifting with the wind into the trees or, or you know, other side of the road, um, depending where you're flying. And we also had the other scenario where we take off with compass use inhibited, do a, do a little bit of flying around, only about, about three metres of movement required in either outhold or, or, um, or, or stabilise, and then the yaw aligns, and then you can switch to loiter and just carry on with normal flying. I've done some normal flying in a quad plane without the errors um, uh, enabled, just to show normal operation uh, with a estimator in fixed wing flight. And on the PEX4 uh, side, um, Wintra have done some testing with their tail setup, and I'll show you the video for that. And they had it set up with 180 degrees of compass error, and that detected the error. And uh, for those of you that haven't seen it, I'm going to play uh, Randy's test video. If my YouTube works. Are you seeing that? Yep, coming through clearly. Right. Now the first test, Randy takes off, just flies around a bit in a non-loiter uh, mode. Uh, the yaw just goes, uh, just resets, and then he's able to switch to loiter and um, and just fly around. Well, he didn't switch to loiter immediately. I think he gave it a workout on this particular test, and then switched yes. to. Did he switch to the yellow loiter, Randy? It, yeah, I was. I didn't realize how fast it was going to convert, so I flew it around a lot, thinking I had to, you know, give it a lot of data. Um, but uh, it turns out that it converges really quickly. Yeah, and then that finished finished that flight in loiter, and I think in the next flight you took off in loiter mode and actually went into a flyaway, and then uh, watched it uh, recover. Okay, we'll um, complete that landing. So you were able to complete that flight in RTL. It is amazing how fast it converges. It's incredible. There you go. That's, that's, um, that's reset the yaw. That was a flyaway, 180 degrees out in the compass, and now the vehicle's able to be um, flown, you know, in loiter or, or RTL mode. So it's possible to actually take off with 180 degrees rotated compass, um, and it's um, reset the yaw, recover the navigation, and then carry on with an auto flight. And now you can see the uh, individual yaw estimates converging. That's the plane uh, flown. Oh, that's right, you had a cube orange on it. Oh, this, now this is worth pointing out the, um, uh, the processor load. It's, it's not as large as you would uh, think on processor load. It's about, on an F4, it's probably less than 1% uh, per EKF core additional on an F4. Um, okay. can, can, these, can that offset of a 180 compass be remembered so it doesn't have to do it the next time? Um, well, if you if you don't if you if you land and don't disarm, it'll remember it, and um, and you can fly again. So you can land, disarm, and then fly again. The next flight, it'll do it all over again. But it comes up with an error message, and uh, actually, I don't think it will let you arm um, because once you disarm and land again, it'll then come up and say that your heading angle is inconsistent with your compass, and it'll flag an error. Um, yeah, we, that's something we need to talk about, is how, how do we communicate this to the user? Because if they've taken off with a compass that's so bad they've had a flyway and it's, and it's recovered, we probably, you know, what it, you can't just rotate the compass because you don't know what's caused the error. Yeah, we don't know if it's offsets or a rotation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we could try to work that out. We could actually fit something which is both offsets and rotation and do a combination of the two, but... Um, it gets pretty messy. Yeah, you know, you know, at some point, it sounds like what we're kind of leading towards, at least not maybe not at this phase now, but maybe eventually, what we could do is make the orientation irrelevant. So it, uh, a compass can just be slapped on at any arbitrary direction, and you just kind of walk around with it, maybe in your hand, and it just learns it, remembers that, and so there is no setting your compass orientation. Yeah, we actually, we, we, yeah, what do we do with the, um, 
if you do a compass calibration at the moment, I think there's the option there to actually take the external compass uh, alignment, assuming that the one on the board is actually the, the master. Is that right, Tridge? Uh, it can actually do all of them, um, even the ones on board, but it, it will only fix the orientation of the ones marked external if the internal yeah. ones don't produce the orientation that you've configured, then it just throws an error and refuses to calibrate. Um, yeah. And so, yes, it does, it does it independently. It doesn't rely on having multiple compasses. It can calculate the orientation independently for each one. But the algorithm is fairly, it's fairly crude algorithm. Um, it is a, a bit like a particle filter, a bit like you've done, but much, much cruder. And in that it has like, uh, I think it's five degree increments. So it's 72 postulated yours and then it sees which one produces the, the lowest square error um, with the uh, the accelerometer data and the gyro data uh, the, basically the consistency of the rotation of the compass vector with the gyro vector is the, I think the, the principal thing it's looking at um, but it only allows you to choose like 90 degree or 45 degree ones it won't give you the last little bit so you can't just have a compass in an arbitrary orientation, but you can, it only selects from our enum orientation options, which are at 90 and 45 degree yeah. increments. Oh, well, that, that, that's, that's good enough though. Um, if, that, if it could be not arbitrary, but arbitrary in units of 45. Um, yeah. And, yeah. With, um, and, and as Randy Rand points out though, with this, with this algorithm, um, at the moment, I just start the algorithm on takeoff, but, I could gate it on GPS velocity equal movement. And I, in fact, on my original testing, a ground-based testing, I could just walk the vehicle around, you know, in, in, in like a five meter area and or just do a bit of movement on it and, the, and it would work out the yaw just based on the IMU and GPS. So in theory, you could walk around, get your yaw to converge and then put it down on the ground and then fly it. We could also, um replace a lot of the code we currently have in our in-flight compass learning that we've got at the moment where you can take off a copter to learn it it doesn't learn the orientation for the in-flight but it could with this and i think it could converge a lot faster if it knew the yaw from this system um for doing the in-flight one I, I suspect we can do a lot better in-flight compass learning now yeah yeah that's um oh what was i going to show you now Ah, yes, the um, yeah, Winter gave me permission to um, share this video, which I'll put up on the screen, see if I can, it's weird, come on. It's probably refusing a PX4 video on an Archie Pollock conference. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm, I, I'm uh, We've got a trying to be neutral when it comes to PX4 on an Archie Pollock, given that I'm supported by both. <laughs> Okay, can you see that? Uh, yep. All right, so this is taking off with 180 degrees of, of compass error. And on tail sitters, that gets really interesting in the VTOL mode. And uh, you'll see it take off, um, start to veer, and then it'll work out that you'll rotate round to the, the correct uh, orientation, you know, like belly down, and then um, continue the climb out and perform its pitch over. So, um, See if I can get the, uh, the the video to play. There you go. It's steering away. Now it's reset. Now it's pitching over, and that's the uh, it can, can can continue on with a normal flight. And then the pilot changes their pants. Yeah, exactly. And you get a, a big angry message on the console saying, land and calibrate your compass. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I wasn't gonna, uh, I, I promise that I've only got three pages with graphs, okay? <laughs> so this is a, uh, an a test where I intentionally took off with the compass disabled and started to do just a, a fairly slow you know, 1.5 meter per second flight, moved about four meters away and stopped. 
And you can see here, we've got the individual your estimates from each of the um, bank of five EKFs. And you can see the red line, which is the gas in some filters weighted average. Um, and then you can see where the main your angle from the main navigation EKF, EKF3, which is the yellow line, you can see where that gets where that resets to the red line. And here from the takeoff, that's about one, two, it is literally two, just over two seconds after takeoff um, with slow movement and, and it's reset the yaw. So you didn't need a lot of velocity. Um, now we have a look at the weights. Because if you're wondering, uh, these are the individual your angles, but what do weights from the gas in some filter look like? And you can see that the weights also, you know, converge in around about the same uh, time frame. So effectively what happens is that by the time the weights have converged, that's when the your reset happens. And the gray line is the your, at least the one sigma your uncertainty in radians. And you see it's, and that's a parameter where you can specify 0.25 radian or 0.2 or 0.5, how certain do you want to be in the yaw before you do the reset? And this is a flyaway scenario, which is much faster um, the, um, you know, velocity. You know, you typically get 10 meters per second or more when multi rotors go and do a flyaway. And the yaw reset happens, it, this was a vertical takeoff. Initially, nothing happens, which is typical of flyaway. You get the first couple of meters and as soon as you get a bit of an error on the position controller, it starts to tilt and the tilt obviously is taken in the wrong direction and then you get that rapid divergence in velocity. And once again, it's about two seconds uh, to get to the yaw reset. And in this, in this instance, with the flyaway, the yaw reset is actually triggered by the EKF failsafe in the copter code. So it goes to the EKF and says, I'm about, to go into a fail safe, can you lane switch or your reset or do something that will get the navigation back? Do what you can. And the EKF then goes in and says, oh, I've got a gas in some your estimate available, um, then resets the your angle. And, um, and, and if that does fix the innovations, then that actually uh, means that you don't enter into the, uh, into the fail safe and the uncontrolled landing. Okay, so that's, that's it for the uh, your estimator and I thought I'd leave the rest of it open for um, a bit of uh, open uh, discussion. I jotted down a couple of points. One was how do we integrate this this your estimator with existing lane switching and flight mode reversion and switching for example in the, at the moment when I take off and fly with it and I've selected loiter mode and it goes into um, and, and I try to take off. I've got loiter mode selected, but I've been able to select it on takeoff and I take off in an outhold mode. When the yaw aligns and it starts using GPS, it'd be nice if it went back into loiter mode. But I have to, at the moment, just flip back and then back into loiter mode to do that. Um, how do we get a bit smarter with uh, combining it with the lane switching? At the moment, I have to run one gas in some filter for each EKF lane, because otherwise there's issues with uh, lane selection. Um, and then what do we do with integrating this? If I've got optical flow and I take off, does that enable us to operate in loiter mode and then move and then get, get a your alignment and then start using the GPS? So there's a few options there. And the second point was vision-based navigation. We, we really need to get that into EKF3. Um, but uh, what's, what are the blockers at the moment uh, for that? So I'll just, just throw it open. Really fantastic. Thanks so much, Paul. So um, any questions from the floor? Hey, Paul, this is Ryan. Uh, quick question. Why are you parallel, parallelizing the AHRS estimations and the EKFs? Uh, is that for uh, search speed or? It's okay. So the reason I'm parallelizing the EKFs is because each one starts out with a separate your hypothesis. And, and the problem with EKFs is that if you're 180 degrees away from the correct your angle, um, 
because you're taking a, a local linearization from the velocity error to the yaw correction, when you're 180 degrees away, the linearization basically, the cam and gains can't, can't fix the yaw. And in fact, you'll see on the, on the slides, if I go to the, um, the slide here, you'll notice that there are some yaw angles that are pretty slow to converge, like this green one. And the green solution is really slow to converge because it's, it's further away from the correct yaw angle. Same, same situation here. Um, so that's why we have to have multiple EKFs starting at different hypotheses so we can get a, get a reasonable initial convergence. Why do we use separate AHRS solutions? Well, because each one needs to be consistent. The yaw angle, how do I explain this? These AHRS solutions aren't using, um, remember they're, they're not using GPS velocity uh, for acceleration compensation. So when the vehicle starts to accelerate in a direction, they will build up a tilt error and the tilt error has to be consistent with the your estimate. Um, if you try to do it with a single AHRS, then uh, the, it'll end up biasing the solution and it's more likely to pick the, uh, the yaw that's uh, um, closest to the yaw angle of that individual AHRS. Um, I can Got explain it. that. So the, yeah, no, that, I think that makes sense. So the quick summary is that the yaw that's being estimated out of each EKF is being fed back into the AHRS individually and that's keeping no, them. Okay, so, so the AHRS, yeah, I haven't shown the feedback part. So we've got an AHRS that's like your, your prediction um, then your EKF makes the, uh, yeah, that's right. So the EKF then will, um, we, we take the yaw, we put it into the EKF, update the yaw state of the EKF, that's the prediction, and then the EKF updates the yaw, and then we correct the uh, direction cosine matrix in the AHRS for the change in yaw angle from that EKF. So there is a little bit of a feedback loop from the EKFs back to the AHRS, which is a, a correction uh, of the Perfect, yaw thanks. angle. thanks. Yeah. Paul, this is Walter Lappert. Uh, I, I, I had a question or idea of, uh, you know, mentioning the visual based navigation. Uh, what if, is there not a way that basically now if you have the, the like a flow sensor on and you had that your pixels plotted as X and Y, that you could then measure the IMU data for which way gravity was, but then also look at your compass and see which way true north was, and then now make north as like a pointed vector on that vision base. You can't do that. Uh, if you just, if you only have optical flow and IMU data and compass data, you have no way of knowing where north is because the, the optical flow data is in the body frame of reference. To determine north, you have to have something that gives you a, a measurement in a earth reference frame. That could be, um, right, that's why I was saying use the, 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 the Z axis to see which way gravity is and then also use the compass to see which well, we way gravity is. Well, we know which way, well, we kind of, the, knowing where gravity is is not the problem. Um, but I'll tell you where I'm now you, you know, we know which way the vehicle's oriented. You know, it's pointing, you know, down is down and which way is north. And that's what I'm saying. So like when it powered on, it would basically. But, but how do you know which way is north? Because yeah, in, in the scenario you're, I must be misunderstanding you. Um, so just to clarify, this scenario is the sensors you have available are magnetometer, IMU, rangefinder, and optical flow. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. So uh, knowing your your angle relative to true north is completely un is unobservable um, because unless you know, unless you make an assumption that you know what the Earth's magnetic, uh, if you knew what the Earth's magnetic field was, in theory, you could, yeah, you could work it out from that. But the problem, but that's what we can currently do. The problem we have is that um, we, well, the reason we're putting this feature in is because there are places where either A, the Earth's magnetic field doesn't match the world magnetic model, or the magnetometer data is so bad that it's unusable. This, this is really there for when you really can't use the magnetometer. So take the magnetometer out of the equation. Now I've just got an IMU 
and a rangefinder and an optical flow sensor, I have no way of knowing which way is north. It's the north is pretty irrelevant. You could, it's just you just end up with a with a local reference frame um, X Y Z Earth frame, and X could be pointing any which way. It doesn't matter if you're doing optical flow navigation. Right, I guess that's why I'm saying to kind of like take that whatever. I mean, I was assuming you did have a, a calibrated compass. I guess I, you know I wasn't throwing that out that you at least you could tell which way north was, and then you basically you would store that as a value in the optical flow so that it knows, hey, this is where when I first started, yeah, this is which way north actually see, was. Optical flow doesn't measure rotation um, at the moment, and we don't measure rotational flow. Uh, our sensors don't provide rotational flow vectors. So I don't, I'm not quite sure how that helps. We'll have to have this talk offline because I think there's something that I'm missing. All right. So thank you very much, Paul. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, we're just about back on, on timeline as well, which is fantastic. So I think uh, a round of applause for Paul. You can all unmute. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, now do we want a couple of minute break before we go on to the next talk? Or do we want to go straight on? What do people think? Good idea. Get a little break. A couple of minute break? All right. Break. Well, why don't we give until say 10 past the hour, so four minutes enough to rush to the loo and uh, grab a cup of tea or something. Does that sound good? Okay, so everyone go and get the cup of tea now. I'll just leave things open so people are welcome to chat uh, if you're already caffeinated enough. And then the next talk we have is a systems update by myself. Uh, so be back in a few minutes for that. Hey, um, who was asking me about the large multi-rotor? I, I, I didn't catch who that was. That was uh, Amilcar. Yeah, one. Yes, Amilcar, I think. Yeah, the uh, medium size really? multi-rotor. Yes. <laughs> Amilcar. Um, yeah, because yeah, I, I wouldn't mind having a bit more of a, well, I'd like to hook up and have a look at exactly what they were dealing with so I can, you know, it's always nice to get, um, to find the exceptions to the rule. Um, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll be glad to send you a, a log or two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, ping me on Skype, and you know, so we can have a chat about exactly what you're what you're looking at there, and um, uh, yeah, because it may be that you've got a, another tuning issue, or it may be a corner case. I'm not I'm not aware of. All right. Yep. So um, thank cool. You. Thank you. And uh, Paul, I expect you you run off to get a coffee or something, but. Um... Uh, Patrick wanted me to talk to you about um, some of the issues that we're having with um, integration of the 3D cameras, like the Intel RealSense. Oh, uh, okay. T265. And um, so, to be honest, I don't actually understand the um, issues as well as Paul probably does. Uh, sorry, sorry, Patrick um, does. Um, but I, I, yeah, I want, what I want to talk to you about at some point is just how we combine the, uh, the GPS with the camera so that we can use both so we can fly from a you know gps environment to a non-gps environment like flying into a you know, under into a tunnel or something um and not lose our and you know and fly smoothly without any jumps uh you know without the user having to do anything how do we how do we combine those two frames together and, and deal with position resets and stuff okay so the the, the positional offset is usually the, the straightforward one the difficulty is the uh your offset so um, what I've done on the ECL uh, PX4 library was we pass the quaternion through from the, you know, because you get a, the revision system will give you a pose estimate, you'll get a position velocity yep. um, attitude. And then by comparing that quaternion with the EKS quaternion, I'll work out a your alignment correction that needs to happen to the external position. And then you have to make the decision about which one's the master. And do you do that like at startup? Do you do that like during flight a whole bunch of times? You've got to continually slowly uh, keep a, a, a track. You'll end up with a, essentially a, a quaternion rotation matrix that defines the rotation from the world frame of the external um, vision system and the world frame of the EKF. And so when you're taking data from the external vision 
system, you rotate, um, you've got to rotate that data. Now the velocities, it's easy. You just rotate the velocities and you can fuse them straight in using the yep. existing velocity fusion method. The positions are a bit trickier because yep. as you can imagine, as you rotate an origin, yep. uh, you're rotating about an origin and the origin is also moving translationally as well. Yep. Yeah, so you so could, you've got to, yeah. got to be very consistent about the order that you do it. And um, I, I, it's all quite doable, but it and, just requires and, careful thought about, we, we effectively really need to put get a little Google doc with the access systems and make sure we're all on the same page with it. Yeah, and you're saying you've already done it in, in ECL? I, I, I did it on ECL with, the, uh, with just the, um, uh, when I'm, using a combination of GPS and external vision. I use the external vision as a delta position, almost like an odometry. I'm not using it as an absolute position because yep. I, I, I couldn't reconcile the, the drifts in the GPS, the, the jumps in the external vision, like with some of the slam stuff when they do a loop closure and it would jump. And then how do you handle that? Now I've got GPS jumping, I've got this thing jumping. Yep. Somebody has to be the boss. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was wondering if you might do that. Yeah, um, so, so when I've got GPS, I use the external vision just as an odometry, a bit like an optical flow. It, it, it yep. really helps a lot, like it really makes it very stable on the position estimate. Um, but if you lose your GPS, then, then the um, external vision becomes the master. Yeah, and we've already got that, um, you know, visual odometry support, I think in EKF3, we did it for the Z, the Z camera many years ago, yeah. and maybe it's out of date, I don't know, maybe you've got something better now. No, I haven't, I haven't done any work on uh, any work on Z for like two years. Yeah. Um, my okay. setup's still there. It still works. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, this is Rob Marnie here. I'll, I'll yeah. have a chat tomorrow morning about um, VO. And hopefully I'll get um, Jim Radford, who's the developer from um, RealSense uh, 265 as well. That'd be great if he can make wow. a long. I was chatting to him on, on um, email. So, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do at ANU is sort of build a VO system that sort of sits in nicely with the RG Pilot. And I guess part of what we want to do is not just create a VO system that has got all these resets and everything, but actually tailor it in so that we're not, we're not doing that, right? We can sort of um, be uh, bounding the error on the VO system from Paul's EKF. Because really the, the VO system um, is a floating system, right? You know, it, it has a floating reference. That's so there's right. nothing to, to stop us locking our floating reference to Paul's, to Paul's sort of EKF. And then that would stop, stop the, you know, stop these jumps and resets and stuff. But I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow morning. I'm just trying to give an open, an open session tomorrow. And I guess what we're looking for is, you know, what is it that people really want? And uh, and how can we best sort of do that? Yeah, no, looking awesome. forward to that. It's yeah, okay, great. Well, I guess we'll continue the conversation then. Awesome, thanks.